It's good green. Trying to get it to full screen. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, some of you may be uh, familiar with my presentation, but I think uh, you know those who are actually first time in this uh, uh, forum. Uh, let me uh, speak about like uh, what the Nobel Turing Challenge is all about, and uh, uh, you know uh, get the uh, you know uh, perspective uh, on this. You know, so you know Nobel Turing Challenge is basically like a grand challenge, like a try to accomplish like a you know very significant goal. Uh, as, as you can see, like a by 2050, uh, there were AI system that can make a major scientific discovery that was uh, Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. I mean, uh, you know, uh, this actually uh, I uh, phrase this in the context of systems biology, so it says like Physiology and Medicine, but this can be like a physics or chemistry or other award as well. So like, uh, uh, you know, you know, you know, uh, uh, some of them uh, worse uh, Nobel Prize period, and then of course like uh, you know, Nobel Prize uh, is just a symbolic. And uh, so, you know, uh, I don't see really that, you know, value itself in winning a prize, but at the same time, it's easy uh, to actually uh, understand what kind of discovery we're talking about. We're talking about like a machine to make major scientific discoveries. And that's, uh, that's the reason why, uh, you know, I, I phrase uh, that way. And, uh, okay, slide SOTA mode. Uh, are you are people actually uh, looking at slide SOTA mode or like a full screen mode now? Not not for screen. Yeah, we are seeing the thumbnails. Yeah. Oh, thumbnails. Ah, okay. So yeah, let, let so me let me. You need to flip that again, I guess. Okay. Hmm. That's weird. Okay. So I have to copy this. How about this? Yeah. Now it's working. Now okay. 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 Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay, so and then uh, already we had the uh, workshop. Like uh, this is like a last international travel before Corona, but like we had like a meeting at the uh, uh, Alan Turing Institute. So this was funded by like uh, ONR Global and the uh, AI scientists, the Grand Challenge, uh, and exactly talking about like a Nobel uh, Turing Challenge. And have like a, you can download the uh, you know report out there. And uh, so it's uh, uh, why a uh, Nobel Turing Challenge. Like initially, I thought like uh, you know creating uh, like an AI to win the uh, you know Nobel Prize or Nobel Prize quality of discovery. <laughs> when I give a talk uh, uh, at the you know people pointed out, okay, I mean, uh, but like a Nobel's will, it says it will give it to the person, so it's, so it's not gonna be like a AI not gonna win it. Uh, at the same time, you know, then uh, if you get a little bit tweak uh, on that. Now, what, what, what happened like if we try to challenge like a Nobel Prize committee in, on a choosing imitation test uh, you know imitation game and then uh, see if uh, they can actually find out uh, you know give it a word thinking this uh, agent uh, you know someone discovered the major science discovery is a human being uh, without noticing that is the artificial intelligence so uh, this is an interesting challenge I mean it's a little bit of a uh, tricky, uh, but if you think uh, deeply, uh, it turns out this is a very interesting challenge. Uh, first of all, uh, this is actually kind of a challenge known as a Feigenbaum test. Uh, Ed Feigenbaum, uh, you know, uh, illustrated the, the variation of the Turing test is uh, whether uh, AI systems can be equally competitive, uh, uh, you know, competent in a specific domain as the best human expert. So this is like a, you know, a Feigenbaum uh, test version uh, in uh, as a scientist, you know, in a scientific field. So that's, uh, you know, very interesting. At the same time, uh, to accomplish this, first of all, there are two, uh, you know, major things. One is uh, the system has to be able to make a major scientific discovery. That's definitely true. And then a uh, system has to solo from outside uh, cannot, you can be indistinguishable from the human scientist. And that's uh, actually uh, the uh, interesting uh, challenge as well. So, so that the, uh, you know, AI system has to be able to communicate and publish the papers and, uh, uh, you know, behave somewhat human like science. But at the same time, you know, uh, after Corona, everything became virtual. So like, uh, you know, you know, it's, uh, interesting because you may not be able to see like a physical presence of the uh, any uh, scientist in a, a real conference uh, you just always show up in a video conference and uh, you know those people might exist and uh, you know it's very then it's gonna be difficult for you to tell like, whether this act person actually exists or is just like a, a you know generated the image of the AI scientist and there is no human uh, uh, do that. okay and uh, you know if uh, you know, AI agent, uh, AI scientists create like a major scientific discovery, publish the paper, 
then people take it seriously or not. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, Bitcoin blockchain, which became huge, uh, is uh, started with the, uh, this uh, single paper uh, in a blog post, you know, Satoshi Nakamoto. And uh, if uh, uh, Nobel Committee on Economics uh, uh, give award for the uh, cryptocurrency and the blockchain economy, definitely uh, Satoshi Nakamoto should be the winner because, like, you know, it's very clear everything started from his this paper. But the problem is no one ever met Satoshi Nakamoto. This is obviously Japanese name, uh, but whether this is a Japanese or someone actually uh, using his name, or this is like a single individual or group of people, we don't know. No one have ever met Satoshi Nakamoto. Okay, there's all kind of uh, theory of who exactly is, but like, we don't know. And the uh, you know, only reason we do not believe this is uh, generated by artificial intelligence is we know AI is not good enough, and that's it. So like, uh, whenever, you know, if someone, some AI system come up with a major discovery, and then you know, with all the experimental data and the theories and publish the paper, just uh, generating blog post, we're going to take it. We're going to take it and take it very seriously. Again. So, uh, two sub goals. First, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the AI robot system performed, uh, you know, very significant uh, research and make a discovery. And the second, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, able to communicate but at the same time, it's very important that you make a strategic choice of the topic and you know, what the research we're going to uh, carry out and uh, the system should be carried out and then what sub goal uh, need to be prioritized. That have to be uh you know made choice have to be made by the uh, ai system if we one ai system is highly autonomous okay so this another aspect of the dis discussion we need to have is that what is the level of autonomy we want to expect for the ai scientists you know if it, the highest level of autonomy would be fully autonomous we just like give like an ai scientist a free run and uh you know it will come up with like a uh, unexpected research area uh, which we have imagined and it turned out to be extremely important discovery that's possible or oh, like i want to have like a, you know user companions so we define okay we want to discover this and then the ai scientists will have the best way to solve the problem or you know uh, exhaust uh, exhaustive search space and uh, discover uh, almost like everything in that hypothesis domain and that's another uh, area which is like a more omics version of the scientific discovery so like it depends on the uh, level of autonomy and you know things are gonna be uh, dramatically different uh, but i think it's very interesting challenge because like it depends on level autonomy there are different challenges different use cases uh different merit and risks so i think that would be very interesting uh not just like a, a technical issue but a sociological issue and ethical issues uh, as well now and there, you know, uh, you know, the historical uh, thing. There, are, of course, like uh, this AI for scientific discovery is nothing new. I mean, uh, as soon as like uh, we got an AI uh, field, uh, you know, created, uh, just later Bruce began in the fire game about this dendro and meta dendro. This is one of the very first uh, uh, scientific discovery uh, project. And also uh, recently, uh, Professor Ross King, who talking after my, myself, uh, you know, come up with like a, this like a first ever closed loop system to generate a uh, ESO genetic hypothesis, uh, design experiment, run it, and verify that. I think this is a significant achievement uh, Ross made. Uh, this is like a no human in a loop system this is a closed loop system uh, created ever and so this is really uh you know uh significant and i think he's gonna update on the most recent progress on this area uh, but also we noticed the uh, uh you know this like uh, automated chemistry so it's uh, you know beyond biomedical fields and you know chemistry area because the chemistry it's more the combinatorial thing it makes sense for a robot system to uh, just you know run an experiment and find it and then uh, you know this uh, uh university Liverpool system also like uh uh, other projects like a dark reaction projects and other projects uh, they are increasing use of a robotic system and then uh, expand the protocol uh, generations combined together to go for the older search space and then uh, uh, you know specific uh, goal directed hypothesis generation to guide us uh, for the optimized experiment to discover uh, you know best uh, chemical synthesis pathway or uh, some sort of uh, solutions we want, them, particularly uh, when optimization uh, is important. Now, so, and then also, uh, I, I think uh, Koichi Takahashi will talk about like uh, his uh, uh, robotic system to optimize the culture condition for the IPS, which, you know, I, IPS system. And I think, uh, you know, uh, you know, tons of example and how we can automate 
uh, experiment. But at the same time, you know, the one reason why I uh, studied this is that, you know, my sense of the current state of science discovery is like at the pre-industrial revolution level. Of course, we have like in a biomedical field, like we have like, you know, high throughput sequencers and then a mass spec and all kinds of uh, fancy machines who generate tons of data. Okay, so like a part of that is highly automated. At the same time, if we get a data, then uh, we have to scratch our head and uh, do the all the uh, uh, you know analysis and uh, you know just think, well you know what's behind this you know what kind of hypothesis and we have to really come up with like okay this could be the good hypothesis well I I come up with a great idea you know that and it's not very systematic I mean of course that is a very exciting part of science I, which I enjoy it most at the same time like uh, you know that's really very opportunistic I mean uh, you know we ha you have to take a chance to make a discovery so like in in, in a sense. Uh, you know, part of the scientific discovery is highly automated and, and you know, very uh, uh, high throughput. But at the same time, uh, you know, the very fundamental core part of the scientific discovery still uh, depends on the human intuitions and serendipities and, and uh, discovery by accident. Of course, uh, uh, that's fun part, but I think this is somewhere we can actually put the science and technology to revolutionize the way we decide. So a very specific example, like uh, I experienced myself, like uh, this is one of the reasons I came up with this idea. Like, you know, my one of the very first biomedical research for me was like a uh, cellular synthesis, uh, which I did about like, uh, Professor Shin Imai, who will be the last speaker uh, tomorrow and uh, not aging. So we come up with like a, uh, computer simulation to understand you know, all the sporadic, uh, uh, fragmented uh, data available at the time, and uh, but try to come up with like a theory behind it. So like uh, you know, what we at the end of the day, what we did is the uh, you know the theory uh, to uh, you know is describing the uh, process of aging, and the, is uh, this like uh, it is about like uh, you know identifying what is the molecular mechanism behind it. And then uh, what is the cellular mechanism? Do, you know what, how those e mechanisms interact, and uh, what are the cellular uh, process interact to each other, and uh, what are the actual players? Like uh, you know what, which genes and which proteins and which enzyme is uh, actually the real player, uh, which uh, underpinning the uh, mechanism. So it's basically uh, you know biomedical discovery. Uh, it is uh, trying to identify. You know, I wouldn't say it's uh, you know every biomedical discovery, but a very large part of biomedical discovery is trying to identify the molecular mechanisms, molecules in both, and the, what are the interactions. It's not, but still, like it's not simple. It will be interaction, it will be multiple, uh, the hierarchical, and sometimes it's recursible. So, uh, but still, uh, you know, we come to uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, what we trying to discover is basically uh, you know that structure. And then uh, that, that is actually really important. I mean, I'm saying that like, uh, every, uh, you know, biomedical discovery or discovery in other area uh, can be, uh, you know, f formalized in that way, but like a very quite substantial part of the biomedical discovery is uncover the mechanism behind it. And that means the uh, molecular mechanisms, the players and the interactions. And that, that's uh, probably uh, the case. Okay, now, and, and uh, so, uh, so and we run the, the simulations, uh, you know, for a quite substantial simulation. Try to identify the uh, uh, mechanisms behind. It. We come up with a specific mathematical structure that can explain the, all the data available at the time. And then uh, we've been very lucky that the, there's only one mathematical structure which can explain the data available at, at the time. So like we come up with, okay, uh, we're very sure that this is a mathematical structure. At the same time, that's mathematical structure. We have to interpret. What is a molecular process that actually corresponds to a specific mathematical structure? And then we come up with like heterochromatin remote ring, and then we have like all the secretion and affecting the uh, neighboring cell and all that. And uh, so, you know, basically uh, that is a combination of the basic bi biological discovery structure, which I mentioned before. So uh, that is the uh, heterochromatin remote ring is the uh, fundamental process. And then that, what is the uh, mechanism enabling that? And what is a specific molecule uh, enabled heterochromatin remodeling. And then uh, on top of that, if you say like a bio, you know, aging and aging is based on the uh, 
heterochromatin demodering and uh, secretions and, and uh, you know oxidative stress and those are the fundamental mechanisms and then how they interact with each other and uh, those other things so it's a recursive structure but still i think this is the fundamental structure still remains so and uh, that that's actually it, it seems to be like a quite num uh, you know broad range of uh, discovery uh, can be formed now then uh, we've been lucky that we uh, uh you know oops, sorry i mean uh, this is a little bit uh, difficult to control and then we found out uh that the, this mechanism uh is the uh caused by like a, a molecule uh like a, a budding with uh, two and the human homolog is uh, one and the dr imai uh at the mit uh at that time, uh, you know, identified actually the ESR2 is the uh, longevity uh, controlling genes for the East and then the human homologue uh, turned out to be searching for me, which became a very big uh, story in aging. Now, yeah, and then, uh, you know, he continued uh, and then uh, identified the overexpression uh, SART1 or extend lifespan the mouse about 20%. Uh, for female and 12% uh, for the uh, male mouse. Now, the whole story, and then I think some of the uh, this uh, effect, uh, you know, searching application by the uh, supplement to chemicals, and now in the human clinical trial, uh, you know, a few years back. But this whole process took us like a two, uh, two decades, 20 years. And in the only place, we are very sure that we did like, a, you know, very extensive search, search of the hypothesis is the competitional modeling. And then, uh, you know, the prior to that competition modeling is like we come up with like a which molecular mechanism we, we you know we come up with like a few mechanisms uh, that we consider to be, should be included in computational model but like we are not sure uh whether we have like exhaust uh you know listing of the possible molecular, me molecular mechanism that should be considered right so like uh, we've been very lucky because we picked the right mechanism to be included in the model and then also the all the parameters like uh, we did the uh, extensive such space but like whether that is actually really the proper uh is uh, uh unclear but at, at least like the only place we did is this extensive computer modeling that provided that the specific uh, combination of me mechanism and then we got the uh, uh, extensive search uh you know and then uh, with the mathematical structure we did biological uh, biological interpretation of the model and that's again like uh, we it really depends on our knowledge and intuitions and we I don't think we consider like every possible biological mechanism whether we can actually consider as like a matching to the model. I mean, we come with okay, this must be uh, this kind of biological uh, mechanism, but like uh, we don't have really the exhaust list of the possible mechanisms and a match against the biological, you know, mathematical structure. We haven't done that. So and then uh, all the experiment verifications. Uh, I think this is a traditional uh, biomedical approach. So uh, you know. Those uh, discovered like, prediction by the computational model turn out to be all correct uh, after uh, three decades. And uh, all the recent uh, reports saying that that was really uh, accurate uh, prediction of what's behind uh, aging. But I think like uh, this journey, we've been just lucky. I mean, like, any one part of that, we could have cho made a bad choice on the kind of mechanism we should consider or the interpretation we made. So it's uh, in a way, this is a very typical and, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, because it really depends on the luck. I mean, uh, we're making like a best guess, but at the same time, there's no guarantee that we are making the, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, very solid uh, choice. So, and then also like, if you look at the system biology, system biology, we have like a, a high quality model at the small scale or a statistical model at the large scale. And, you know, when we started systems biology 20 years plus, and we expect a very large scale precision model can be built in the future. And then we're not getting there. And there are a lot, quite a number of reasons. We have the cognitive limitations, sociological issues. And then my conclusion is system biology, science for AI, or at least like a human AI hybrid system, because like many of the effort trying to create a system biology, high precision model at the large scale, pretty much go beyond our cognitive capability and sociological limitation as well. And of course, our cognitive programs, I'm not going into the detail, but like, there are quite a number of issues that uh, that hits limit. For example, uh, just take an example, like a number of papers that we can access. I mean, uh, uh, this is stats uh, 10 years ago, so I, probably it's getting to the 2 million paper by year by now. That means like a 5,000 paper per day, and you can't read it. Even if you are in a specific area, for example, like if you're in oncology or immunology, for example, hundreds of paper per day okay there's no way you can access that you can you know, read that 
And then you consider, we consider like we are actually uh, looking at the important papers, but how can you know a priori a prediction of which one is important is not possible. And you look at the nature, cell and science, but uh, there could be important paper in uh, very peculiar journals uh, as well. So like uh, there's no way that the, uh, you know, uh, we can access to that. So like uh, we are trying to, uh, you know, do the science based on the up-to-date knowledge or the discoveries, but we are just, you know, accessing an extremely small part of the, what has been discovered. You know, that's a reality. So like uh, that's really we are on a shaky ground. And this is the, what our team did for the East signaling. We wrote, uh, read the 1,500 papers. Uh, this is the most extensive uh, signaling map of the eukaryotic cell covering the uh, fairly every signaling process of the East. But, uh, you know, it took us years. And uh, when we complete this like uh, almost 10 years ago, uh, after that, we cannot update it because it's not possible to keep people just keep doing this reading paper doing. So like we have to really automate this, which is actually uh, part of the discussion uh, coming tomorrow to automate the knowledge extraction. I think this is critical. So like, uh, you know, if we do the humans do this, uh, there are quite limitations on how you're going to do this. And then also there is an inconsistency as well. And also when you read the papers, uh, uh, you know, consider, uh, you know, what is the most likely uh, uh, knowledge we have, like, you know, 90% report saying like one thing and just 1% or probably 0.1% saying the other way around. The question is, can you notice that? Or if you notice that, you cons you dismiss that as like error or uh, you consider this is like very important discovery in specific conditions and therefore you should look, look after that. And it's very difficult. I mean, if it's like a one thing and if it's like 100 papers and then just one anomalies, maybe you can go for it. But if this is like a really hot area, we got like a thousand papers and they have like a lot of those uh, inconsistencies that so there's no way we can do it by ourselves. I mean, I think we need a systematic approach to be able to do that. I think we need like NLP, hypothesis generation, knowledge extraction, consistent matching. So like, you know, those are the very simple example that limits human, human cognitions. And there are also the career perspective. If you keep doing this, I mean, uh, you know, what kind of uh, position you can get in the future uh, at this moment, uh, it's very questionable. So it's very difficult for us to, uh, our students or, uh, you know, our researchers, okay, you keep doing the reading papers and then they get the inconsistency and the right map. And it's, it's sociologically not possible as well. And uh, so like we need to really solve the problem. You know, I think it's power of computing, power of AI is critical here. And, uh, you know, therefore, uh, my conclusion is so let's create engine for scientific discovery. Now, so then going to the basic of scientific discovery, uh, you know, we, we, you know, kind of working definition, you know, if uh, consider this is the massive search, uh, search and verification hypothesis space, and then uh, we, we, we can just do it. And we should be able to create a machine to do it. And then uh, this is really two uh, case study of the Nobel uh, winning discovery. Like one is like IPS discovery, Shia Yamanaka. The other is a conducting polymer by the uh, Professor Shirakawa. It's like, uh, it's like Professor Yamanaka actually looked into the phantom database and found out 24 genes and which may, uh, which enabled the reprogram the cell, which was a major discovery by itself. And then, uh, so this is a search, right? And then he actually uh, ran the, uh, uh, leave one other experiment to identify the minimum set of the genes, which is known as the Yamanaka factors of four genes. And so this is the optimization process. So like, uh, you know, I, I think there's a whole lot of complexity behind this, but it's pretty the most simple uh, interpretation of the process of this discovery is basically in search and optimization. Now, in uh, Shirakawa's case, uh, this is the conducting problem. So like uh, he, had the, he had the intern from the Korea Electric Companies and then uh, this uh, intern uh, tried to get the polymerization experiments and this screw up and they put like a, a, a chemicals in a thousand times more dense than they supposed to be. And then it turned out that they get a polymerization going on. So this is a complete accident. It's kind of such complete unexpected such space and they got the interesting phenomena. And then after that, uh, you know, he just optimized the conditions and then, uh, you know, got the, uh, you know, very uh, stable polymer, uh, polymer uh, thin film polymer formations. And then with the uh, Professor uh, McDamia and then uh, Professor uh, Higa, uh, he actually turned this into the conducting polymer. And this is, again, this is a search and optimization process. And, uh, you know, this is a two iteration of search and optimization enable the uh, uh, stable uh, formation of the conducting polymer thin film. And so th this is, so like it's, I, I would say like uh, not every uh, discovery is like this. They're probably like a other form in you know, modality process of discovery, but like a, at least that uh, we can see 
a quite number of major discovery can be actually, uh, uh, you know, for reformulate uh, as a search and optimization process. Now, then, uh, you know, practically how we should proceed. I think we should really have like a, a strategy to go for it. And for an AI system to be able to get a data and do the experiment to verify that, uh, we need the multiple layers of the system. That the one uh, okay, uh, system is we have like a functional module need to be uh, you know connected, either the software or experimental connections uh, systems. Now also each of them should have like a high capabilities. So like a basically like a basic AI module uh, should be on top of that. And then probably uh, if you uh, ask like like, okay, let's discover uh, this or this optimize this condition, and then uh, you know the integrate AI module uh, will be able to run it. And then, then uh, probably we need autonomy. So like if we believe this path, and then that will be uh, you know we can have like a task coverage and then a connected research lab in the AI system, and then get the uh, you know highly autonomy system. I mean this is the one strategy. Of course, we can actually try to get the autonomy first, and then try to increase the task coverage as well. So I think like uh, in, in a way like uh, Adam and Eva Rosking, uh, first Rosking created is the uh, highly autonomy, high autonomy, uh, you know, uh, not entirely, uh, you know, food autonomy, but like uh, provided the uh, specific uh, topic and uh, given autonomy and run it. And then, uh, task coverage is like a, he, his system, I think, have like a very specific uh, generation. It's not everything. And uh, I have a generation also like experimental procedure was limited. So, task coverage is not really high, uh, probably medium. But like, and also like intelligent autonomy is a medium as well because it uh, has like a limited to the specific domain. So like uh, there are multiple uh, possible paths uh, towards the high task coverage and the highly autonomous uh, AI scientists. But I think it'd be uh, very inter interesting. At the same time, it's very important that we're gonna have a closed loop system. We're gonna have like all the knowledge extractions and then uh, you know consistent mechanism and high positive generation experiments. You know uh, this is uh, one possibility of the closing this loop. At the same time, uh, we should really notice like a data and then uh, all the publication what has been published has a substantial errors and then uh, uh, ambiguities and some of the uh, study has been fabricated so we cannot trust that but it's very difficult for us to tell in advance that like, which one we should believe which we should not so i think in this iteration process we should be able to screen out where i got a high reliability uh data set and then all the uh, you know uh, knowledge uh, you know, that, that's kind of interesting, uh, you know, very challenging process. At the same time, we cannot really, uh, uh, you know, identify which one is true and which one is not true a priori, because like uh, sometimes, you know, the, you know, all the knowledge we believe, everyone agree that's true, turn out to be, you know, false, uh, you know, f with, with some discovery. And there's uh, uh, all complexity out there. So like uh, we have to really reason in a very uncertain ground in terms of data knowledge. So I'm just saying like, this is kind of tried right zone reasoning, but uh, you know, we really, uh, you know, have to uh, operate on the twilight zone uh, in, in a sense. Okay. Now, so we can actually uh, get the, I think like, you know, how are we doing the time actually? Okay, we have to probably uh, finish. Uh, yeah, you have now. three minutes. Yeah. So uh, two, three minutes, yeah. So if you look at the AlphaGo, for example, this is very uh, interesting. We can learn a lot. And AlphaGo actually start from the all the uh, record of the play and then get the deep learning to be able to predict what's the possible next move. And they get the self play to get the reinforcement running to be able to uh, navigate like a best possible move on a given condition. So like uh, provide like uh, all possible move of the goal, state of the goal. And in the human game uh, played game, the record is a little small uh, subset. And then uh, AlphaGo, because of this uh, self-play expanded the search space in the vicinity of the one human has played. So like a day, you know, AlphaGo knew uh, by the time he, uh, you know, play against the, uh, you know, human masters and knew like much broader search space uh, or the state of space would go and they got the answer uh, how to play that. It's like, you know, there's no, no way human can beat that. AlphaGo zero, which I think is very interesting. Oops. Uh, yeah. Uh, it is actually a discard this like a human record. You got the random search. So it's a tabular rasa and then a, a sparse entire space random search. And it's saying, you know, gets stronger than AlphaGo or the best of humans. But it's very interesting because that indicates, you know, what AlphaGo search uh, is biased toward the human uh, aesthetics, right? So, uh, you know, so like, uh, you know, in a game of Go, there are stronger ways to play the uh, game of Go 
rather than what we place, it's not in the vicinity of what we have done before. So like it was like a, because using a big data uh, based on the human uh, uh, play uh, record on their past, and it was like a such space skewed. Uh, so like AlphaGo Zero actually did that, you know, whole space search. And that's very interesting. And uh, in our, our case, like, uh, you know, I work in uh, experimental science, that means that we need AI and machine learning. And I think we need the modeling and simulations. This is a very important part. And our, you know, the reason why I forgot so successful was the evaluation of the state of the play has been possible. And with that, that if that is too expensive, they can't really run many runs. And, uh, uh, you know, the problem we face in experimental science, that part is expensive. And that part with a high precision experiment, the devices that could be rousy as well. So we need to build high precision experiments also to reduce the cost of the experiment evaluation. We need to have a very preci high precision modeling and simulation as well. So like we need to have really those three things together uh, to be able to expand what we learned AlphaGo uh, to the uh, real, uh, you know, experimental science as well. So uh, this is what we have uh, talked about. Like, uh, and so like in a scientific area, you know, the same structure. We can start from human no discover knowledge, uh, but of course, like uh, then I think this is the first thing we should do because, uh, uh, you know, that's all we can actually uh, learn and discover. At the same time, in the future, if we can really do the like, uh, you know, entire such space, the the problem is this scientific, tr you know, discovery is what is the entire such space is not defined. I mean, it's almost infinite. Uh, so like, uh, you know, how how are we gonna go for that? It is the uh, big, uh, you know, difficult. I mean, this is a comparison. I forgot. Clear cut boundary and then, you know, finite boundary. It's very big, it's finite. And the scientific discovery, the boundary is not clear and uh, you know, almost like an infinite. So, like a very different such space. But I think this is a really uh, interesting challenge and worth it. Now, some people might ask, like, uh, you know, how the AI system will understand the asking right questions. Uh, so asking right questions, sociological phenomena uh, as well. Uh, you know, the, this is important because your uh, career. Uh, for the active scientists is limited, not forever, and also the resources you can use is limited. So, like, for you to be scientifically successful, you have to ask the right question because you have a limited time and uh, resource. But if uh, AI system, although this uh, bottleneck can not be eliminated, if you can actually reduce significantly by having like a, you know very large number of experiment, hyper generations, very precise and high. Uh, you know, resource efficient experimental microfluidics, for example, uh, that will actually reduce the bottleneck. Then the question would be, you know, ask every question and an important answer may be in there. I mean, uh, so like, uh, this bottleneck will not be eliminated, but it will be significantly reduced. I think that could be a very different modality for the science as well. And this is also important because, like, uh, you know, if you consider like a number of temporal order discovery and then, uh, you know, uh, significance of discovery in one specific value system. You know, if 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 uh, you know if, uh, you discover something more important and uh, even more important in you know, consecutively, that's easy. We can just go for it. But sometimes, the, you know, science is that uh, complicated, more complicated. You might find like a, you know seemingly unimportant discovery combination of them result in extremely important discovery. For example, like a CRISPR-Cas9, for example, that was, uh, I wouldn't say important, but it's important because it's, uh, uh, you know, injecting your value virus, so sort of. But like, uh, you know, it's uh, um, immune system archaea and then, uh, you know, that kind of research, which, uh, you know, uh, I think it's very interesting research at the same time, it's not well-funded part, but like a combination of that result in CRISPR-Cas9, bam. Okay, so, uh, you know, you, you, you have like a, this kind of non-linearity. And then the reason why one have an AI and robotic system is actually overcome this. Because like, uh, if you consider something unexpected to happen in the long tail side of the discovery, you know, it's very difficult for humans to systematically invest on that. But like, if you can really do uh, this uh, in a machinery, you can just go for the such space. So, like, uh, you know, interesting discussion is like whether, like, uh, what kind of this discovery to be made and where, you know, such to be directed. Uh, can the AI mimic like a human value system? Is that a good thing or bad thing? If we consider like a human value system, if that is short sighted, you know, system not gonna explore the important such space. But like, if you actually detach from the human value system and go for like all the free run such, you know, and it's running for something uh, which may not be considered un not, that in not that important from our perspective, a specific time point, uh, but it turned out to be extremely important. So this is more the horizon effect in terms of scientific discovery. Now, 
Uh, last thing, okay, so that, well, they're, they're all kind of like our technical activity, but I'm gonna skip this. So I think it's really important, and also the architecture, I think it's gonna be the distributed system. This is more like a bog, but uh, uh, I think this is really, uh, you know, for a lot of instance of the system. So uh, at the end, like, uh, you know, we're gonna also discover, like identify what it means the serendipity or scientific intuition, and we probably need to find them. And with this, I don't think we're going to have like a human-like scientific discovery by AI. I think we're going to have an alternative form of scientific discovery. And I think that will be an alternative form of intelligence. And in, uh, in practical benefit, we can accelerate the scientific discovery at unprecedented speed. Therefore, uh, we'll push our civilizations. And uh, but this is like a SBI OIST joint project. And in OIST, uh, we're going to run uh, launch the project uh, you know, very seriously to get the automated the, uh, uh, multi omic system soon. And then I have like all kind of uh, system uh, down the road. So this is the OIST campus. And uh, this is uh, right now in virtual, virtual, but like I hope like you can actually physically uh, visit OIST. Uh, but uh, by the way, we're in a Star Trek uh, Picard. Uh, there's the uh, Daystorm Institute in Okinawa. This is supposed to be the most important uh, uh, institute in the Federation. And then they come up with the uh, highly advanced uh, AI system and robotic system built in this lab. And this looks like OIST, and which I like it. And then uh, uh, data actually was created by this uh, institute in Okinawa. So we do it. Uh, so we're going to create AI scientists comparable to the data in the future. And we're going to, uh, we'll go, no one have gone before. Thank you very much.